I am going to start sharing my screen. Just want to make sure. Can everyone see my screen? We can see it. Yep. Cool. Um, so I'm Vibu. I've met pretty much everyone here. I've done quite a bit of work in NLP. So yeah, let's get started. As everyone knows, I like to keep these presentations pretty open. So I want to do more of a discussion instead of me just reading through slides. So if anyone feels they want to hop in, say anything, contribute, feel free. Don't worry. Don't cut. Don't, I don't mind if you cut me off or anything. One thing is, I actually can't see the chat right now. Um, so if anyone's saying anything in there, just if someone could bring it up, that'd be great. But yeah, feel free to chime in anytime. Any questions, comments, feel free. So this chapter is chapter 16, I believe. It's on NLP with RNNs and attention. So, okay, um, where have we gone? Okay, so here's a bit of an overview of the chapter. So we start with generating some Shakespeare style text and we're gonna use RNNs for that. So the first example was a stateless RNN and stateful RNN, pretty similar. After that, there's an example of a sentiment analysis project. It's done on the IMDB data set. From there, we're gonna look at machine translation. And after this, this is where the chapter starts to get more theoretical. So that's when we look at attention and transformers. So the first half of this is gonna be more project-based where we'll look through example code and Jupyter notebooks and stuff and kind of go line by line to see how stuff is implemented. And then towards the end, it'll be more based on theory, attention and future stuff. Just a note, the book was written a couple years ago, so it's not the most up to date with all the attention information here. So there'll be a bit of stuff that might not be in the book that'll come up, but yeah, let's get started. So the first example was this generating Shakespearean text. So it's a typical text generation type approach. So we're gonna look at the data set first. So the data set is essentially a pretty long text file. It's not really pre-processed or anything. It's about 100,000 characters long. We use 90% for training, 5% for testing and validation each. And some things about the data set, it's basically just a super long text file and it's gonna be one hot encoded. So we've talked about that in the past. It's the type of like way to just input text into models as numbers. And there are about 39 unique characters across the text. It's just examples of Shakespeare's work listed out, like different quotes of his talks, plays, poems, and whatnot. So it's just a straight long text file of a bunch of his work. So we're going to start with a character-based RNN. And then we are going to have to note that this is a sequential data set since it's more of a book, right? So we don't really want to randomly sample things because we don't want too much overlap between train and test set. So that's also something we have to look out for. Here's kind of an example of what this data set looks like. There are some pretty short samples where it's just a couple lines, couple words. And you know how Shakespeare kind of has his distinct way of writing and it's kind of different. So that's kind of what we're looking to achieve with this model. We don't want just basic sentences. We want to kind of mimic how Shakespeare would write. So we want to have an end model that predicts something like this. And of course, there are also longer samples in the text. So we have to deal with that as well. Okay, so what we're gonna be doing here is using a character RNN model and trying to generate text one character at a time. So essentially we're gonna input in the previous X characters and then pre predict the next character based on what's already been given. So this is kind of an example of what's happening. So the input here is gonna be the first 10 characters and then the target is gonna be this last character. So for example, we wanna make a model where we can input in first city without the N, well, citizen without the N at the end. And we want our model to predict this last character of N. So character model means we're basically going by each character and predicting what the next character will be. Um, typical shuffling, batching stuff, pretty old stuff. So, um, one thing that we need to know is we can't input just straight text into a model, right? So we need a tokenizer. We're gonna to do character level. In the example, we use a hundred characters at a time and try to predict the hundred and first pretty much. 
And the author uses a very simple like RNN based model. It's just two GRU layers stacked together and then a softmax output over the 39 characters to predict the next character. So here's kind of how that tokenizer would look like. So we have a basic TensorFlow package that just lets us tokenize text to sequences. So for example, if we want to tokenize this hello SDML, it would just convert this text into a bunch of numbers. Then we can, of course, take those numbers and print it back into text. So this is the first step. We have to get our words converted to tokens and pass that along to the model. When it comes to making the model, Keras and TensorFlow make this pretty simple. So it's as simple as just creating a sequential model, creating your two layers here. So the author chose to use two GRU layers. They're RNN LSTM layers. We've talked about them in the past. They have a hidden size of 128. And then this is our N softmax layer. And then we're going to use an atom optimizer with a categorical cross entropy as our loss function. So train it over 10 epochs. It's pretty straightforward. This is again what the model looks like. And yeah, it works pretty well. We're going to be inputting some characters and predicting the next character. So let's see. Deepu, can I ask a question, yeah. please? Yeah, yeah. What does it mean by time distributed? I saw that uh, in the did... reading also, and I just don't know what they're talking about. Is it somewhere on the presentation? Yeah, have it? so in the, the third window. Sorry, can you repeat that? The yeah, right one? there. Yeah, so yeah. after the GR2 layers, um, there's yeah. a dense layer that says time distributed. What is that referring to? Oh, uh, That's kind of just referring to the time, like how text goes in order of time. So like it's being passed on step by step. So like there's a previous like letter that we're looking at. It's kind of how RNNs go in sequence, right? So it's just kind of a straightforward, feed forward layer of this RNN. It's kind of the way you would implement it in Keras. And yeah, that's all it is. It's just a normal dense layer being added on to the end of these GRU layers. So, okay, what... so it's, it's just saying that's going to be sequent. The characters are added sequential. Is that it? Yeah. Um, Ryan, were you saying? Yeah, I was, I was going to basically add that the, the GRU is returning a, a sequence. So it's giving you the output for every step of the GRU. And so a normal dense layer would just take in a single input. So if you think of like your stack of layers, you've just got like 10 layers and it's just got one input. The time distributed, what it's doing is it's saying basically apply this dense layer to all of the different time steps. It's expanding it to an additional axis. So you can apply the dense layer to the time axis. Or in this case, it's not time, it's, it's tokens. Yeah, great way to put it. Um, that's essentially just how you would add on the dense layer. Sorry, go ahead. So it forms add... RNN. So, so basically, it... if, okay. if we have a single RNN and we input a sequence of length eight, and that RNN, like shown here, is going into a time distributed dense layer. Okay. So then after the first input, is anything going into the dense layer? I'm not sure who you're pointing that question at. Yeah, yeah. I would, yeah, I would say, sure. right. I would say so, yes. <laughs> and, and so then, um, because uh, the way I the way I think of Time distributed is basically like, um, well, is that basically that that linear layer is going to have to wait for different time steps before it can get its inputs. It's gonna, it's gonna sort of store the output from the first one and then store the second one and store. And so if it's, if it's a, 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 a linear you know, whatever, five, then it, then it has to wait for five time steps before it has collected enough inputs to then do its thing. Yeah, pretty much putting all that together, that is just the Keras implementation of how we would add 
a linear layer on the output of something like an RNN, an LSTM, or a GRU layer. That's just kind of what, that's just how we'd implement it in Keras. Um, so, so the alternative, mm -hmm. if you didn't do time distributed, it would mean that every time step, you're just taking the data that you have at that time step and you're running it through a linear layer. You're not using anything from earlier or, or later time steps. So that's kind of the contrast as I understand it. But it's not clear to me in this particular example, since, since the GRU has no... So I guess this GRU, ha when it's return sequences equals true, it basically has a, an effective sequence length of 128, right? Yeah. So I think that's saying that the linear layer is going to be 128 inputs. Is the model summary helpful? I think you printed it on the next slide. I saw the number 39. What, what 39 is, that is the last output. That's the output, like that's the activation stop. So this is this max ID term. So going back to the data here, there were 39 unique characters in the text, right? So that includes the 26 letters of the alphabet, commas, periods, questions, and whatnot. So at the end of everything, we have to output third, like our output has to be over 39 characters, right? And then we're going to pick the most likely character. So that's not really related to the input of this. It's just that that linear layer takes an input of 128, shrinks it down to 39, and then that's what we softmax over to get the output. But um, this yeah, time distributed right, though, is just, yeah. I think Robert's right. What we do is we look at the, the output, uh, the line above it from GRU3. So yeah, the shape the on output, that is- The shape is of this batch. is 128. Right. So, so it's batch size is the first dimension, right? The second dimension is um, our... The length of the uh, sequence, I think. Time. The second dimension should be the length of the sequence. And, uh, and the third dimension is the hidden layer. Yeah. Is yeah. that right? Yeah, that's my understanding. Yeah. That's why the first yeah. two are none, because they're both variable. But the thing I don't understand is you can't have a variable size linear layer. That's what linear the that's layers. what the time distributed that's is what... doing. It's basically saying we have some some weight matrix that is 128 to 39. And you're going to apply that to all of the time steps that you have, regardless of whatever the length is. And if I'm not mistaken, I don't actually use Keras too much. I use PyTorch, but you don't need this time distributed layer. You might be able to just give an input of 128 and output 39. If I'm not mistaken, this isn't actually necessary. I think you can just explicitly state the input size of this and output to whatever you want. So is that the time shouldn't... distributed basically just the equivalent of return sequences equals true, even though the yes. dense, the dense layer doesn't have a return sequences argument, so it's kind of filling that functionality? To my understanding, so, yes. It, it, so then effectively... it was just kind of... Sorry. No, go ahead, Ted. Go ahead. I was gonna say, so effectively, what Keras is going to do at runtime training or inference is it's going to make as many copies of that linear layer as it needs based on sequence length. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's my so understanding. Each, so each linear yeah. layer, so I was wrong what I said before, each linear is really only processing the data from that one time step, but it's gonna make as many copies. So Can, when yeah. you say return sequences after, after the first input, GR2, the first GRU layer and the second GRU layer are only having one output. And so there's going to be one linear layer with its 5,000 weights. After the second input, both of those are going to, well, after two time steps, basically the, the, the second GRU is going to output two items. And so, so TensorFlow is going to need to make effectively two copies of the linear layer. 
and so on and so forth, and up to whatever your sequence length is, it's going to need to keep making copies on the fly until you hit your maximum sequence length. Can you can you go back to the previous slide? Okay. So there's there yeah there's a few different things that you can do here. So the the GRU layer right now it's set to return the sequences. So that's saying if you got 10 tokens like we have there, however many that is that says hello SDMO, um, that's going to return 10 back out. Um, and then with that, the time distributed is going to expand that dense layer that we have to those 10 characters. And Ted's thinking of it as expanding the dense layer. I kind of think of it more as just a for loop. You just have your dense layer and you're just applying it to all of the different time steps as you go. Um, the alternate option, it wouldn't, it wouldn't work for here, but something you see very frequently is instead of having return sequences to true, you have that set to false, which is the default, and it will only release the last output after seeing the full sequence. And then you can apply a dense layer to that and do some sort of classification or something like that. But you you do actually need that time distributed layer because if not, the, the dense layer will try to just apply to the last dimension and it won't it won't know how to apply to a, a rank three matrix, basically. Um, so you you do need that time distributed part. Okay. Um... Let's move on from this since this is a pretty long section. We'll come back to it at the end if we have more time. But um, I think that's just too specific on how the implementation is in, in um, Keras. Okay, so once we've trained our model, it comes to using the model. So this is a text generation problem. So what we're doing is we're essentially just gonna predict one character that's pretty useless. So we're gonna wrap our use case in a function to essentially print a new character and then add that back on to our already generated text and then re-input that and continue that. And to do this, we must explicitly give a desired output length. So here's kind of the code for just starting. Let's say we have, how are you? And we wanna predict this last letter to see if our text worked, if our model works. So we're gonna type in, how are you without the last letter? We're gonna run it through our model, get the arg max of that, and that will give us the next most likely letter. We're gonna um, take the token and convert it back to text. And it looks like we actually did predict you. So that's good in this case, but one character is useless. So here's a little function to just wrap around and keep, um, or no, this is a function We'll get into this one in a bit with temperature, but yeah, you can wrap this in a function to just loop around and keep predicting to whatever length you'd want. Okay, so um, this is kind of the function that the author does and they use this term temperature. Temperature is something that affects this output, this argmax here, and it essentially lets us decide how strict we wanna be with our softmax term and how much we wanna trust the model's output. Do we want the model to be like very, very strict, be like 100%? I think that this is the next character out of these 39 and I'm gonna use this one. Or do we wanna give it some leniency in case we might be overfitting, underfitting, or just to add some randomness so we can, we can kind of control that with this temperature term here. So the book goes into the math of how this works. It's essentially right here. Um, it's, it's just basic math for how we would adjust this uh, parameter. And the reason we wanna use it is because one thing that we'll notice with a lot of text generation models is that they get pretty confused when you leave them to do what they wanna do. And they'll often repeat the same word or character again and again, and it's a very common problem. So for example, with text generations by word, one thing that we'll see in most models is that they'll keep repeating the same word like it, and they often get stuck. So a model might be predicting like today the weather, and then it just gets stuck on that word. It can say today the weather, 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 weather. So that's why we wanna kind of use something like temperature or there are other approaches to solve it. The book here just talks about temperature. And the way you fine tune it is essentially a higher temperature will output, um, 
all characters having equal probability. So if we change this temperature function to something like the number two or three, it'll essentially forget our model weights and just randomly pick between one to 39. A low temperature of zero, close to zero, will kind of use the exact value our model wants to predict. And then something in the middle closer to one is where we can kind of fine tune it. So it, it just kind of came out of the blue that this was this section was kind of added on. There wasn't too much more in depth about other options, but there are other options you can do. You don't have to use this temperature variable, but here's just an example of um, how we did it. So this was kind of closer to the number zero where the, the sentence that our model pre predicts doesn't really make too much sense. It's like the belly, the charges of the words the be and belly. It's kind of just stuck on this word belly. If we set the temperature closer to one, it looks more like actual Shakespeare text. And then if we set it to two, this just kind of shows how this variable works. And it's just randomly predicting characters. So the author kind of just threw it in as an option to show how you can fine tune when you want to use your actual model. But that's kind of as far as we went in the book. After that, we have stateful RNNs. This was very similar to the last example, pretty much the exact same model and everything, except in this case, we're actually using the hidden state. And just something to note with that is we, we have to pre-process our um, data a little better because we can't have overlapping samples like this. We need them to be sequential. So there's just a couple of pages on how we would do that. Same model, same thing, same temperature, all pretty much applies. There was just a little distinction of stateful versus um, stateless RNNs where we don't use those previous hidden states. Okay, the second example was on sentiment analysis. And here we look at the IMDB data set. So this is another application of NLP where we kind of try to gauge the sentiment of, in this case, a review, but it can apply to anything it can apply to. I know someone earlier today said that they were looking at news sources. So what is the general sentiment of the news source? You can look at tweets, that's pretty common. In this case, the author decides to go on the IMDB database. It's basically a huge database of movie reviews. And the great thing about this is that it has this binary target for each review with zero being negative, one being positive. So the general data looks like this. We have 50,000 movie reviews, which is text stuff like actual reviews of a movie. And then we have a score, a zero or one if the review is positive or negative. Then some things to note that make this data a little more interesting compared to our last case is that there are longer sentence, there are longer sequences that we have to actually use and process. So we have to deal with that compared to in the past where we could learn just on very short samples of his writing, how he writes. Now we have to actually process these longer sequences and understand what's causing mm -hmm. these review sentiments. So in this case, we use the first 300 characters from each review. So first couple sentences of a review, can, you can kind of gauge whether it's a positive or negative review from that. It's pretty uncommon that someone writes a great review and then in the last line, they're like, by the way, the movie was terrible. So just to shorten it up for training's sake, we're gonna use the first 300 characters for each review. And then we're gonna have our negative and positive targets. And yeah, I noticed there's some stuff going on in the chat. Okay, let me take a quick look at that. Doesn't I, I seem... think you're good. There's not a okay. specific okay. question for you. Okay, so um, let's set up the model for this sentiment analysis. So first we have to pre-process. We're gonna use the first 300 tokens. So we're gonna cut that off. In this case, we also have a much larger vocabulary since we're no longer just doing a character model. In character models, it was pretty simple. We only had 39 characters, so a simple softmax, pretty easy. You can just predict the next character. Now that becomes a little, it's a little challenging here because we have 10,000 words. We're gonna pick the 10,000 most common words. So pulling a softmax over such a large distribution causes some issues. We'll see how we deal with those. Um, the author decides to use an encoder decoder architecture, I believe here. There's, I don't know, in this case, there's just an embedding layer, the same basic two GRU layers. So simple RNN, but we add an embedding layer and we'll talk more about this. It's pretty important. So 
yeah, pre-processing pre -processing requires taking the first 300 characters, building a vocabulary of the 10,000 most common words, adding padding tokens because everything has to be the same length for our model. So we add padding tokens to pad everything to the same length to the length of 300 in case some reviews are shorter. Like some reviews are pretty short. There's only 40, 50 characters. So we just pad the rest and then the author goes into the math and how you can kind of have these pad tokens be ignored by the model. It got a little too complicated for this. So that's in the book. Then yeah, very similar model architecture. We're just having an embedding layer. So this is the embedding layer, our two GRU layers, and then a dense layer at the end. And once again, that's going to be a sigmoid of one to zero this time. Last time we had a soft max. Uh, yeah, last time we had a soft max over the 39 characters. This time it's just a sigmoid of one to zero because we're only predicting whether the review was positive or negative in terms of sentiment. So this is how we'd make that embedding layer in Keras. Um, this is just the Keras implementation. The masking, once again, it's explained more in the book. And then, yeah, so we have our vocab size, which we said was 10,000 words. And then we pass in our tokens to the embedding layer. It goes through the two GRU layers, output over a dense layer with the sigmoid activation, which will give us a one or zero. Then same thing, in this case, we can use binary cross entropy because it's either just one or zero, atom optimizer, and then we're just gonna train over accuracy. So the, the key thing here that changed was the author decided to add an embedding layer. And we're gonna kind of look more into what embedding layers are and how they kind of transform the NLP space over time. So embeddings are essentially a way that we can get richer text information from words instead of just one hot encoding. One hot encoding kind of gives equal weights to everything until you train it. So embeddings allow us to kind of get this great feature rich texter, uh, text vector that will be able to have some more information. So for example, you can see how things like cat and kitten are grouped close together. Houses and dogs are grouped far apart. Another common example is the difference. The distance between man and woman is the same as the distance between king and queen. So we can see how these embedding vectors have some information on these actual terms. So instead of woman being the same thing as cat, we have some information on what that word could mean. So these embedding layers can have their own dimensions. We can train them up. Whoops. We can train them up. They have their own embedding dimensions, typically a larger dimension. A larger embedding dimension allows it to store more information. And yeah, in this case, we use, I think, embeddings of size 128, if I'm not mistaken, and we train those embeddings. So they're, uh, they, uh, they enable us to capture context, word meaning. And the great thing about embeddings is that after we've trained this model once, we can reuse it. So when it comes to actually training, we notice that on such a small sample of 25,000 reviews, the model starts to do pretty well on this sentiment analysis task. And we're able to reuse these word embeddings that we've trained on these 10,000 words and apply it to further tasks down the line. So that kind of helps opening up the field of NLP because not every area has a lot of data. So what's essentially happening is we're not only just capturing context in terms of reviews, but what we've noticed is that these embeddings tend to pick up more general things like just basic word understanding, basic English, like that they just start to understand the language English, like um, grammar or whatnot and how, how the language works. So we can use these embeddings in different models and fine tune them towards different things. So. This kind of shaped the NLP field quite a bit. We had large companies train really big models with really great feature-rich embeddings for different words and kind of release those to the public since they did a lot of the back work of training these. There was word to vec by Google in 2013. There were glove embeddings by Stanford in 2014. Then this BERT embeddings came out and they've all kind of just been getting better and better and allowing people to get better NLP models through, pre through this pre-training task. Okay, after we have the sentiment analysis, 
we're going to look at machine translation. This is like the next step up again, it gets a little more, a little more um, complicated. So the example the book used was English to French translation, pretty common task used all across the world has great impact, but let's see how it's actually made. So the model that we're going to be using now is an encoder decoder model. So we're going to have sentences, pass them on to an encoder, an encoder layer, which I believe we talked about in chapter 15 two weeks ago and in chapter 13 as well. So if everyone's been following along, the book has kind of gone over the fundamentals of how these layers kind of work. Like even with the embedding layer, we talked about it in the past and how they work. Same with encoder decoder layers. We've, we've kind of talked about them, but now we're actually putting them into use. So this chapter didn't go too specific into what's actually going on in these layers because it's been talked about in the past. So I tried to add some other stuff here so we can try to understand it. If anyone's still confused, we can have discussions on these. So essentially what happens is the English sentence goes into this encoder layer. The encoder layer will feed into the decoder layer and then that will just output our translated sentence. So one important thing to note is when training, for each step into the decoder layer, we're not only gonna put in the encoder output, but the way that we train is we give the decoder the actual previous word. So in this case, we're training from English to French. So for example, if we want to translate the word ball, we're going to give it our previous step of the encoder. So we're going to give it what our encoder has encoded the word in English to be, plus the actual French word that it should be. So it can kind of learn that way. And we're going to fine tune which, way, which one it uses. Will it use the previous encoder step, will it use the actual decoder step? And it kind of just helps speed along our training. So this is another look at how this works. So we kind of have our, we have our sentence here. Um, in this case, for this example, the author decided to switch the order. So we went from I drink milk to milk, I to milk drink I, because that's common in French where we flip the, um, the order of sentences. So we, ha we have that embedding layer first, it goes to our encoder, our encoder passes our information along to our decoder. Then our decoder kind of just spits out whatever it thinks is the proper term. We do a soft max over that, and then we get our, um, our translation. This is very similar to the section we had last time because we talked about the sequence to sequence models. So this is a basic sequence to sequence. I'm not gonna to go too much into depth how did those work because we just did that a few weeks ago. So this is just the architecture they're using. And um, yeah, so some notes about this is that now that we have variable lengths, once again, we need to pad everything. Um, in actual use, when it comes to using the model that we've trained, one thing that I noted was that we're gonna pass in the actual previous translated French word, right? We can't do that anymore because we don't have the translation anymore. So we kind of have to skip that. We're just gonna feed back the actual predicted term. We have to ignore everything after this EOS term. Um, the output vocabulary was very large in this case. So in this case, we had 50,000 words. So the author brings up this example of a sampled softmax. Sampled softmax is essentially just a softmax over the sample of the actual word. So for each word we have, we're, we're kind of taking a guess at what the prediction, what the predicted word should be, right? So in this softmax, we're gonna take a small sample of random words plus the actual word. Since we have, since we're training with data and we know both the English and the French words, in this sample, we have to be sure to include the actual translated word and just a sample of random words. So that kind of brings our softmax down from 50,000 to whatever we want to set it at. And then this also, obviously you can't do it in actual inference when you use the model, you just have to softmax over whatever there is. So that's one thing. And then, um, yeah, so one thing with this sample at softmax is you can scale down how much, like how large of a sample you use. And this is where, training models becomes more of an art than a science where you kind of just have to take a feel for what you think is right, what's a good output size, 
and adjust accordingly. You can scale things separately. You can try different ratios of things like, when are we gonna actually use the exact decoders proper term versus the encoder outputs? You can try it for like the first half use 70% of the time, I wanna just let the model do what it wants and learn that way. And then 30% of the time, I wanna use the proper thing. So we wanna make sure we're not getting stuck. You can tune that to 50, 50, 20, 80. It's just all kind of something you need to play around with. Here's the um, code to implement it. I wrote some notes on the side of each line and what's going on here. Um, this is all just initializing Keras stuff. Then we have our encoder layer that we made here, still more initializing. And then it's still pretty it's still pretty simple with Keras to just create and call a model. We, I mean, yeah, we just initialize everything. We have basic hidden states, we call the model and we train it. I'd go more into this, but this is pretty much what we did two weeks ago when we talked about sequence to sequence models. So same theory, this is just the application. Um, these notes I'll share in the presentation. They're not in the book. I just kind of added it on line by line. If we have time towards the end, we can come back and go through all these model implementations. But yeah, the theory we all understand from before. Um, so what eventually ended up happening here was once again, we use regular LSTM layers and we start to run into issues with that. So. We've talked about LSTMs, RNNs, GRUs before, and we all know how there's that issue of long-term short memory. So how do we approach that? So the first thing we did was, well, first we know LSTMs can only look forward. So that causes issues in sentences like this. So here's something that we're trying to encode. We have three sentences. We have the queen of the UK, the queen bee, and the queen of hearts. Queen here, would have a very similar encoding in an LSTM because it's only looking forwards. The first two sentences are all the same. So it would kind of be encoded the same, but as we can tell, these are all very different uses of the word queen. So little history after LSTMs came bidirectional RNNs. That's kind of what this image is here. So in this case, we'll look both forwards and backwards. So we kind of get a view of the sentence beforehand. So this, this LSTM would look at the queen of the UK, UK the of queen the, and then it could see that compared to the queen B and how there's different use cases here. And we'd get a little bit better embeddings. So there's just kind of step ups of how you can improve your models depending on the resources and whatnot you have. And yeah, this was just kind of one of the middle time steps. Eventually, as we all know, after this book was published, attention and stuff took over. So the author does go more into depth on how these RNNs work, bidirectional RNNs and stuff, but I don't think it's worth going into all that detail. Then um, another issue was with our softmax. When we have 50,000 words to predict, we can use sampled softmax, but that's only apl applicable in training because we have the actual word that we're trying to predict. So we can use that in a small sample, but when it comes to inference, there's still issues with that because we have a very large output of 50,000. So this is where the author brings up beam search. Beam search is kind of technical if you look into the math of it, but the concept of it is pretty similar. We're essentially just gonna pick the top few terms instead of the top number one output, and then compute a few more lines down and see what are the best possible outputs for the next couple words and pick the best solution? So here's an example for how beam search works. Let's say that our model is a character um, based model and the next term it thinks it should print is either A, B, C, D, or E. It looks like it's pretty close between A and C. And A is a higher probability. So it could just predict A but then, but then C here is also pretty close. So what beam search does is it takes the top few probabilities, constructs trees of the next couple characters, and then it kind of picks the best route. So it's a tunable parameter. It's pretty easy to use in, in uh, Keras and PyTorch. You can just set how many beams you want, what are the tree lengths and whatnot. And then it'll predict the next couple characters, pick the optimal. So. This also helps with our um, softmax not getting stuck. One of the issues with this um, 
large output of 50,000 words is that models like before, they tend to get stuck and repeat themselves a lot. So there's a good chance we would just repeat the same word again and again and again. And that's where Bean Search really shines. So this example just kind of shows letters. So it's not the best, but let's say it was showing words. There's a good chance that this model could get stuck and it would have very high probability of predicting the same word again and again and again. So that's kind of where Beam Search really shines. That example wasn't really showed too much in the book, but that, that's the practical use of it. And yeah, that's kind of how we advanced on machine translation. So we had this simple example of just LSTMs, GRUs, we had bidirectional RS, um, bidirectional RNNs, LSTMs, we had um, beam search added, and then eventually there was attention that was introduced. So attention kind of continues that trend of playing on the issues of beam search. Beam search is great, but it also only works for short-term length. It's still working based off of an RNN, which struggles from the short-term memory issue. So since RNNs have that short-term memory, it can only do so much when beam search is playing off of that output. This is where attention came in. Attention is essentially a word, a word matrix that calculates um, relationships from each word in one input to each word in another input. So for every single word here, there would be a different tree of how much influence it has to everything else. So for example, in this sentence here, it's talking about like an animal. So the animal didn't cross the street because it was too tired, right? We can see how even all the way towards the end of this sentence, this model, this embedding is still putting it in relation with the animal. So if we use something like a simple regular LSTM, this dependency would start to get lost. And with something like attention, we can see how the and it still refer to animal. And then animal, if we were to do this next tree of animal, we would see how animal is related to tired. So that's kind of how attention really helped speed things up. It was quite a breakthrough. A lot of stuff today is still based on it. And um, it the way that attention works is it's based on encoder weights all being sent to the decoder. So if we look back here at our encoder decoder models with RNNs and LSTMs, one thing that we notice is we only send this last hidden time step to the decoder. So we go through an entire encoder, then we send one little term to the decoder. What attention does is for each term here, we're gonna store and send all those hidden terms for each term to the decoder. And then we're gonna draw relations between that. So it kind of just helped us create even better embeddings. As we can see, NLP is based a lot off of embeddings. So attention just helped us get more feature rich, better, better embeddings. And it allowed models to kind of understand relations between words better over time. It allows us to look both past, present, future, and draw connections wherever needed. The way attention works, it, it gets pretty technical in the book and I didn't find their example to be the best, but here's kind of a rundown from Jay Almer's blog. So um, each token, like we said in the encoder has its own hidden state we're gonna pass all those on to the decoder. So the decoder gives a score to each token that gets passed in, and then it takes a softmax. So don't worry about how these scores are, com are computed. The way that these are computed, it's pretty technical math, but um, basically each term gets passed, each encoder's terms hidden state gets passed on to the decoder. All of those hidden states get given a score on their ranking for importance. So they're basically trying to rank in this example, we're gonna take the word it and rank it and rank every other word compared to it. It's gonna do a score based on how, how closely do you think this term is relevated, is um, connected to every other term here. From there, we're gonna do a softmax of these scores. What that does is that essentially draws out the not useful terms, they're like non-connected terms. So for example, the term because here, it didn't get a high score. So once you softmax it, its score basically comes down to zero. The word animal had quite a high score. So once we softmax it, it gets more importance. So 
from there, we multiply each vector by its score, and then we get our embedding matrix, our embedding vector for that word. So that's kind of a little rundown of what happens. We take each word here, pass it on to each word here. So we'll give each word a score based on their ranking with the word. Then we'll drown out, we'll drown out words that have low scores and then increase the importance of words that have high scores. And that's how we're getting our embeddings. That's kind of the backbone behind how attention works. And there's many visualizations of how words are related, but yeah. So following attention, we wanna kind of see its uses, where was it used? So it can kind of be used anywhere since the backbone of attention is just getting better embedding layers. So it applies to kind of all of NLP. So in this case, we had translation, there's summarization, general uh, generation, text generation. Those are kind of the few we've looked at so far. We've also applied it to vision. The thing with vision, comparing it to CNNs, is that it's pretty easy to use and explain. We can kind of view where the attention is and how two things are connected. So attention kind of had that great effect where it's applied everywhere. It's been used quite a bit. And it led to this new model called a transformer. Transformer hey, models are kind of the next, yeah. Sorry. Um, uh, I just. If I could, I just want to make a, a brief comment before we get into the transformer. And obviously, transformer is really important. Um, yeah. So before we had attention, the way you, the way you carried information about the, if it's NLP, about the other words, is you just had this, um, this, this embedding, this representation, this hidden state, whatever, you know, this one single you know, set of floating point numbers that had to carry all the information. So in bi-directional, it can come from both sides, but basically every other word that came before you, you just have this one thing. So whether it's one word or five words or 20 words, you had to all just shove it into this one set of numbers. So even if you don't understand all the math, like you were saying, that's complicated. The key thing that's different about when you use attention is you don't have to compress it into this thing you simply have available, you can look at all the other words individually, you just have to decide which one, how much you want to weight, which one. So the intelligence of deciding, you, you hope the model learns really well which words to pay attention to. But if it does learn that, it doesn't have to compress this stuff, it can just explicitly, like you were showing, it can explicitly do a weighted sum of the ones that it actually decides it should be paying attention to. Yeah, so exactly. there's a very big and difference between having to carry it into this compressed thing versus just, no, I, I can actually just right, just look at it. It's stored right there. I'm just going to look up. Yeah. And to kind of explain that like visually, so this is what a typical encoder decoder model looks like. This cell right here under this encoder, this is how a typical LSTM, RNN, any of those bidirectional RNN, this is essentially what they look like. So at each um, cell state, you have a hidden state that's outputted. You pass on to the next term, the next term, the next term. And then at the end here, we still only have, as Ted is saying, one hidden state. So this arrow kind of just, it compiles all that information from our text into one little hidden state of whatever size you want, and then pushes that to the decoder. Now, this is where attention differs. So we're no longer constrained to this single arrow going across the input. We don't have, we just, we don't have to force it into one state anymore. We, so you see how there's a hidden state here. We're going to take another arrow here, save that, take another arrow here, save that. So we essentially save every step's hidden state, pass all that information onto our decoder, and then fun math stuff happens and we get better embeddings. But yeah, so there are benefits and downfalls to that as well. So some of the cons are that these attention transformer models, they get very large as you can expect because all these hidden sizes, they're not small. Like for an LSTM, you might have a hidden state of size 128 that's being passed along, but it's only one. Now, let's say we have an input size of 512, each hidden state is 768. You can see how we have a lot of information to pass on. Then we can stack attention layers and whatnot. So one thing with attention in these things is that they do scale quite large and that these models get very, very large. So as much as we give it more data, we have very big model 
it's not always the easiest to work with and train, but that's where coming into this stuff, um, the benefits come in where these transformer models are based on attention and they're great for transfer learning. So essentially all we need to do is just train this model once and we can use it again and again and again. So there are huge, large companies, Google, Facebook, Nvidia, they'll train these huge models and allow people to use them. So it's hard to do, hard to train, but once it's done, it's easy to be reused. So that's kind of where this big aha moment came in. As much as it gets computationally difficult to do, you only have to do it once. So yeah, continuing on from there, that's where we have this transformer model. Looks kind of like LSTMs, RNNs. It's kind of the new state of the art for them. It's the backbone of it is these attention layers. So it's just stacked attention layers to get very feature rich embeddings to then compute whatever we need to compute. Okay. So yeah, going back into them, transformers, they're very, very large models because they have actual um, embeddings of those sizes. For example, the BERT model does have 768 feature long embeddings. And then each of those times a 512 um, batch si uh, input size. So all that stuff really adds up. We stack multiple attention layers and yeah, we get really big uh, models. They're trained on entire like web scrapes of the web. For example, they've been training stuff on all of Wikipedia, Reddit, Twitter, whatnot. So yeah, these models are huge, trained on huge corpses of text. They cost a lot of money to train, a lot of compute, a lot of time. It's not really feasible for people to retrain entire transformer models on their own, which is why the community kind of puts these out. So companies like Google, Facebook, LinkedIn with these resources, they'll train these very large models, they'll spend weeks on whatever in compute clusters they have, and then they'll kind of just output those model weights and it's really easy to reuse them. It's as simple as just using those feature rich embeddings for each words as a lookup table and then downstreaming to whatever task you want. So yeah, that's kind of where a lot of these advancements in NLP started from because everyone suddenly had a lot of access to really great models that could be used really easily. So they're great for transfer learning. And the reason for this is because the way these transformer models are trained isn't on very useful stuff. Like we looked at text generation. It's a pretty useful thing. We looked at machine translation. It's used pretty much every day. But when it comes to training models for transformers, a lot of these are just trained for the use of transfer learning. The goal with these models is to just get a general language understanding. So we're trying to really get a deep understanding of what words mean in relation to others. So when we look at these embeddings, these are very simple. Like we had a couple of features here. We made embedding tables. We can see how cat and kitten are close together. Dogs and houses are separated like the distance between king and queen is similar to man and woman. But the goal with transformers was to get much larger models and just really understand that. So we're kind of trying to understand the human language. How does grammar work structure? Try to have like chat bots, summarization, stuff like that. So to do that, we don't always want to just train on simple tasks like translation. We don't want to train on things like um, sentiment analysis. The people that created these models, they actually came up with their own pretty unique um, pre-training tasks. For example, they'll use masked language predictions. So what this is, is essentially you'll give in like a sentence and mask out a word. So for example, the sentence like the boy was happy he had ice cream, and then we'll mask out the word happy, and then we'll train a model to try to predict that. And then we'll do that over all of Wikipedia, all of Twitter, and try to predict word by word. Now, the output of this model isn't really useful. No one's in a case where they have blank words and they need to predict stuff. But what that does do is it lets us really learn how words fit where they should be. And we had similar tasks like that, to like next sentence prediction. It helps us learn the structure of how English is structured. Other languages too, they're not just limited to English, but we kind of learn how are things structured, where do words go, what do words mean, and we can build really great dense 
um, feature vectors essentially of these words. So that's how back, that's like the backbone of what transformers are. And then once we have this really great understanding of what words mean, it's pretty easy to just downstream this. So they're applied pretty much everywhere. Some examples of current NLP tasks are summarization, translation, classification, sentiment analysis, question answering, POS tagging, vision, uh, machine translation and whatnot. So you basically can apply all these pretty easily. They're really easy to use. You just add a couple of layers at the end of these transformer models, fine tune it towards your task. It's just like calling an RNN or LSTM layer. Um, there's really great resources out there now to like make literally like basically no code models where you can just call pre-trained models and like do model dot summarize. And Hugging Face is a really great resource for that. The Hugging Face library on uh, PyTorch and I believe TensorFlow too. Um, they have a lot of great documentation on how to use these models. They'll teach you how within a few lines of code, you can have like pretty great state of the art results towards any um, anything you really want. And then some examples of some new current models are like the BERT model. It's very famous, GPT-3, which everyone heard about, where it's supposed to be um, having the goal of being like super human level intelligence and like replacing general um, chatbots and whatnot, like being able to write its own code. And then we can see how like other models play on old models. BERT got very famous. I think Facebook research made Roberta. It's just a bigger scaled up version. And then we have countless transformer models. You can find a lot of them on that hugging face library. And um, some of the missing information in this book was really using transformers. So um, yeah, the, the author had great examples, great notebooks on how to use like the um, stateless, stateful RNNs, the machine translation, the sentiment analysis, all that stuff was there, but there weren't really like Jupyter notebooks on the transformer sections and how to use those in Keras. Um, if anyone's interested on how to do that, I can like share other Jupyter notebooks I have. I think I did a talk for this group a while back on text summarization that had transformer stuff in it. So that talk should be in the GitHub somewhere. There should be Jupyter notebooks on how to use those. Um, other than how to use them, a lot of the like layer visualization was kind of missing. So there's a great blog by, um, there's a couple of blogs actually by uh, Jay Alamer that kind of go into each layer of transformers, how they work, what they look like, what's going on behind scenes. So I think it's not really the book's fault for missing a lot of this information. The book is a couple of years old, but there's just a lot more information that's like easier to access now and honestly laid out a lot better than this book is in my opinion. So if anyone wants to get more into depth on like how to use transformers and whatnot, there's other resources than this book that would really help. Um, I think we can probably make something in the Slack and share stuff like that, or anyone can always reach out. And then a lot of the math behind what this uh, what attention is and how these transformers work, like what kind of happens, how do we create those really great detailed embedding layers? That wasn't really explained too well in this book, in my opinion. Um, if anyone is interested, we can always do another section on that. I wouldn't mind like going more into depth. I'm not sure what everyone reads this book for. Some people just want general understanding of what's going on, what the state of the art is, how it works. Not everyone really wants to get into how it works and the math behind everything. I did a couple of years ago. I like took a bunch of notes on how everything works, the math behind all this, it's all there somewhere. So I can share those. If someone, if people are more interested, we can do a full on session on like the math behind all this, how to create custom stuff. So. That's always an option, but that that just wasn't explained that well in the book. Um, yeah, any other questions on the chapter? Anything we want to go back on, discuss? Uh, oh, awesome. Yes, Maybe. can you please uh, drop a link to your GitHub where is all of these interesting models? The and models I just are remind, on the... Well, in the chat. And they're on the uh, hugging face. There's like ah, a yeah okay. website. I'll, I'll share it. Yeah, or if someone could pop that in the hugging face stuff. 
Mm -hmm. Okay. And you thank add you. something else? Okay. I just want to remind everybody that we can uh, save the chat if you want it for future reference. That's it. If you want to save the links, yeah. I don't know if um, if Ted or Ryan would know. Do we have like a resources section somewhere on the Slack or the GitHub? Because I have a lot of this stuff on transformers, like bookmarked and saved somewhere. I don't know if that's. Do we have something like that, like a database on the um, group? Because I wouldn't mind uploading a lot of these things there. Yeah, we don't yet, but I think transformers. This is a topic that would be worthy of just creating a special document. You know. Yeah. And yeah, I, I think like, that was like, also like the, I had to store off like the, the, the links to the, the Jay Alomar's blogs and other stuff too. Yeah. So um, I'll give people a moment to think if they have any questions from this. So there's a couple, I think there's a couple things in terms of like big trends uh, for, for people to maybe note that, that sort of occurred simultaneously with with the transformer, so so you mentioned the one, which is that the training tasks are these pretext tasks. It's not what you actually want it to do. You're just finding a task so that it can learn general understanding of language, right? So the key thing about those is that those are what we call sort of self-supervised tasks. You don't need to have labeled data. So you know if you're doing pictures of cats and dogs, somebody has to say this picture is a picture of a cat. This picture is a picture of a dog. But if you're doing the trick where you just say uh, every sixth word or so approximately, I'm just going to blank it out and you predict the missing word, you don't need to do that because you just start with the sentence and you randomly delete some words. And so you know what the answer is because you're the one who deleted the words. So there's a lot of stuff we could talk about, um, but, but exactly what you said, by using a self-supervised task, now you can just go mine like all web pages on the internet and you have a huge corpus of stuff, right? So that's, that's one big thing that happened. And so I think theoretically you could have built some LSTM models and you, got, you would have gotten better performance than you did with the ones that we had at the time if you had come up with the, using these self-supervised techniques and given a much bigger you know, training set. I think another theme is the output in the BERT model, in this transformer model, was exactly the same shape as its input. And that meant that they could just stack these layers. Um, and so ultimately when the BERT paper came out, they had sort of like BERT regular, and then they had BERT like large, which instead of having whatever it was, instead of having six layers that had 12 or instead of 12 that 18 or whatever but it meant that you could very easily just pile on more and more and see if it worked better if you had enough compute you know mm -hmm. um so i think that's another theme that we saw because if you if you look at like the way cnns were built you have these pooling layers and things keep getting smaller and smaller in terms of the the image size you might have lots and lots of um channels but it keeps getting smaller so you couldn't you, you couldn't just really arbitrarily build a CNN that's like deeper and deeper because right at some point it, it, just, it just can't get any smaller. But with these BERT like models, because the output was the exact same dimension as the input, you really can say, well, what if I did an extra large that's 24? What if I did a super extra large that's 30? There's nothing stopping you from doing that. And that's why like when GPT-2 came out, GPT-3 was, was sort of a pretty easy evolution because they could say, I'll just make everything bigger, make the embedding size, you know, 25% bigger. I'll just stack, you know, twice as many layers, whatever. Um, you know, I think that's one, one big thing. And then one negative, which, which people might not realize is when you have this attention and you say, okay, I'm currently looking at the word it, let me just store all of these embeddings and have a trained neural network that decides how much to weight all those previous things. When we, all the architectures that I've seen, when you do this, an RNN can do unlimited sequence lengths. Now you're storing all of these. And so typically you predefine how much you're willing to store. And so now the one negative thing about these transformer models is they usually all have a maximum sequence length. 
So you predetermined 512, 1024, 2048 is how many tokens you know, I'm, I'm going to build into my architecture and that's it. So if you have a sentence that's 2049 tokens, you're up the creek. You, 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 you know, you've, you've hardwired attention pointing to those 2000 things. Um, and these models work amazingly well, right? It learns which ones to pay attention to and which ones to ignore, but we've now got this fixed sequence length. So we lost that one really cool thing about RNN models where you just could have, you know, unlimited sequence length. So I just want to share, I think those are a couple themes. If you're just kind of reading high level about, you know, what's the state of the art, what are the new models that are coming out, you will see these, definitely see these patterns repeated. Like Vibhu said, huge corpuses of training data. The only way you can get that much training data is it has to be self-supervised tasks. It can't, you can't say, hey, I want uh, this intern at my company to label, you know, 500 billion <laughs> sentences or something like that. Um, and then, and then this, this, this stacking thing. So, so that's where some of these later papers, people said, hey, wait a second, what if we tried some of the earlier things? What if we tried RNNs or linear things with some of these other tricks, with semi-supervised tasks, with stacking things that are the same dimension? And they've gotten some pretty good performance. Um, in my opinion, the transformer still beats them. All right, that was maybe longer than I originally planned to. Sorry. I don't know, thanks Stop. for the high level overview, Ted. Yeah. Um, so were there any questions from Vivu on, on any part of the, the, the presentation? I think someone asked about PyTorch versus Keras. Um, if you do look into like more state-of-the-art transformer models and um, like papers published on them, a lot of that research work is done in PyTorch as opposed to Keras. So that's kind of like a barrier to entry, I guess you would say, because a lot of the code there, you'll kind of need to understand PyTorch to use it. Other than that, um, they're both pretty solid. I think I just switched over to PyTorch at some point. I feel like it's leveling out, like like Hugging Face like has decided that, out, they're like... gonna, um, that they're going to, that they're going to, you know, they, they ported a lot of their PyTorch only stuff so that now it's both PyTorch and TensorFlow. Um, and then I like, think when it comes to stuff is, like, go ahead. I was going to say when it comes to stuff like using pre-trained models and stuff like using the Hugging Face library, it's pretty easy to do in either if they support Keras or TensorFlow as well. But when it comes to like messing around with creating your own transformer models and doing stuff outside of Hugging Face, a lot of the resources and research you'll find will be more more PyTorch uh, oriented, and there are also like more more reasons for that. It's it's kind of laid out in a better way to adjust parameters and whatnot, in my opinion. And it's kind of easier to adjust layers and whatnot. But PyTorch versus Keras as a whole different discussion, I believe. Okay, cool. So I then, wonder uh, about. I uh, want. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, I wonder about the following thing, that uh, training networks on different text could be very different. For example, on Twitter, there are a lot of abbreviations. They drop mute uh, E, they use U, just letter U instead of the whole word and such and such, because uh, well, they're limited. Uh, on Reddit, there are other things, comparatively, for example, with Wiki, Wiki, is uh, usually not very emotional, but uh, what we, I see on Reddit could be rather emotional. So I wonder how it could influence the models, the transformers. Anybody so knows? One thing with these um, transformer models is that they're like stacked multi-layer models of like different, um, they're like stacked like 12 layers, let's say. and. Something that you begin to notice is like towards the last like 10th, 11th, 12th layer, they do start to get pretty particular towards the task they're trained on. Like the last couple layers might be very good at mass language prediction or next sentence prediction. Or let's say that those have really like adjusted towards picking in 
what goes on with the Reddit language. So the goal that we really want with these models is to just get those feature rich embeddings and get that like general English, English language understanding. So what people will do is they'll kind of take previous layers, they'll take like the 10th layer and they won't really use the like fine tuned part of the model. So they'll just kind of take it to that point where it's understood a language and then they'll need their own data to fine tune it towards whatever task they want. So people kind of do a lot of like research into it. There's a lot of blog posts that'll go into what happens at each layer, what is each layer looking at, what is each head of attention kind of focusing on and how can we extract just what we want and how do we fine tune that towards our actual goal? But no, you're you're very correct. Like, it's not even just the understandings of how people speak and how language is written from where they're trained. It's also an issue of these tasks because these tasks aren't really useful. Like predicting blank words doesn't help us. So if we find it better to just take a model to to take the model a few layers before the like last layer and use that because that's more general. So. We can, we can do things to get more general understanding. And you also have to play with how much data you have, like whatever your task is. And let's say your task is very different to what the thing was trained on. If you don't have enough data, then you know there's not much you can do. But if you have a lot of your own data, you might even, if you have enough data, you could retrain a whole entire transformer from scratch. But you kind of have to play that game of like, how much do I want to use? Where do I want to pull back and whatnot? Yeah, I will add that as a trend, there are different pre-trained large models that have been trained on different things. So like one that might lean more towards, you know, Twitter versus like Vibu saying, you know, Wikipedia is, you know, very, very more formal in its, its language. But what we're seeing is that now people are just creating really super giant models. So for example, they're no longer training language specific models. They're training a model on all the different languages. Now, of course, not all languages are equally represented, but the point is if this model could be trained on English, French, German, Russian, Hebrew, Arabic, Chinese, and Japanese, and it has almost identical performance to the English only version, if it can learn that, it can also learn the difference between sort of how people speak English in tweets versus how people speak English in uh, 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 you know, a high school essay at, at, you know, versus a, a, a you know, journal paper, that sort of a thing. You might get slightly and, better performance again on one that was trained on that type of a, a specific corpus because you know, in a super short tweet, it might not always have enough context to know, hey, this is a tweet, right? But in general, the, these language models, if they can distinguish a lot of things. And to kind of add on to that, um, there are like, there's, there's a bunch of resources out, uh, outside of just Hugging Face, which will have a bunch of like, you'll have a BERT French, BERT Spanish, BERT Chinese. They have like different models for every language. Another thing we need to realize is like some third world smaller countries, which try to like create their own language models, I've like read papers of very small countries that don't have as much access to this type of text. So it's not like they can go out because I, well, sometimes they don't have access to the text. Sometimes they don't have access to the resources because there isn't as much demand. And what they do when they need to retrain a language model for their um, language, they're still able to like peel back at this large general BERT model and kind of start from where they need and they can just fine tune on their language. There's, there's approaches, papers, and there's, there's ways to get about this, but that pre-training, it still showed us that that general like linguistic understanding is somewhat standard and there's still benefit to using stuff like that. And this is all still more of like a high level approach. Like a lot of this stuff, you don't really have to like look into. There's libraries that will do all this for you. You can really just like three line of code, like take your raw text, use a library to get like any transformers you want. Um, embedding and then just run that embedding through a pre-trained model really easily. Um, there's packages, Hugging Face has pretty much any model you could need. It's not just these like big BERT ones. A lot of people will fine tune these models for specific things. You can even search by the task you wanna do. Like if you wanna do question answering, you wanna do summarization, you can find models that are made for that and how to use them. It's, it's a lot easier to implement nowadays. 
But I think just from the approach of this book and how we're looking at it, that high level approach of, of knowing what's going on, it's always useful to just have a basic understanding of that. Cool, thanks, Bubu. Okay, it's um, it's one thirty. So I think what we'll do is officially we'll we'll end the recording and we'll we'll um, 